Thank you for joining us for this quick lesson. As always, to learn more about financial modeling, Excel, shortcuts, accounting, and investment banking in general, uh, join us on our website, www.wallstreetprep.com. In this quick lesson, I'm going to show you how to build a cash flow statement from a given income statement and a given balance sheet. This actually represents one of the more foundational types of exercises that you'll need to master if you want to do, do more advanced financial modeling or even really um, basic financial modeling. So I've given you a simple balance sheet, a simple income statement, and an empty cash flow statement. And the challenge is going to be given the balance sheet and you have two periods in order to build a cash flow statement you need to have two periods worth of the balance sheet um, the current periods income statement as well as an empty cash flow statement for that same current period and the challenge is to using only information provided only the information provided to arrive at a cash flow statement so the reason why this is important is first of all it doing this exercise will enable you to solidify and really understand the relationship between the three financial statements. As it turns out, the cash flow statement is really purely a reconciliation of year over year changes in the balance sheet. And to some extent, for some items on the balance sheet, like retained earnings, where the year over year changes are really broken out in the income statement, the inc having the income statement available is also pretty important. So um, not only does this represent, I think, what is sort of accounting 101 sort of the the end of semester it's actually the typical end of semester accounting 101 type uh, final exam where you're given an income statement and a balance sheet and you're and you need to build a cash flow statement but it also represents the core of financial statement models um, you'll open up more, most financial mo statement models and what you'll see is an income statement a balance sheet and a cash flow statement that is fully derived from those uh, from those two financial statements um, the financial statement models you'll see in investment banking and private equity and corporate finance can be fairly complex. So what we've tried to do here is really take out all that noise and give you give you a, a taste for how to build those types of models, um, but without again without all the noise. So let me set up the exercise and then we're going to go step by step through building it. Um, this company um, has reported their financials um, for t for 2012. Um, so 2012, we see a company with assets as illustrated all the way down to liabilities, um, all the way down to liabilities and shareholders equity. It's a simple balance sheet. Um, we also have some information that we've already forecast that I'm giving you, like what, what are accounts receivable going to be at the end of next year, uh, the end of 2013. So this is, these are really forecasts. We've hard coded them here for simplicity, um, but what we haven't given you is cash. And in fact, in order to get cash, we're going to have to figure out what happens from the beginning of the year where they have a cash balance of 34 to the end of the year after the, after we've identified all the inflows and outflows that are associated with cash. So that we'll only be able to get this uh, number once we finish our cash flow statement. Um, in addition, in order to sort of help finishing the cash flow statement, we've also forecast for 2013 what the company's accounting profits are going to look like. In other words, what, what is their income statement going to look like? How many revenues are they going to generate all the way down? And what are the expenses all the way down in net income as well as dividends? We make two disclosures you're actually going to need. Um, one is that although we've aggregated depreciation and amortization expense, you'll typically see DNA or depreciation and amortization represented as one number. Um, we've disaggregated it. So we're telling you amortization represents 5 million of this 20 million uh, figure and by the way everything here is denominated in millions um, also dividends as a fine point are all in cash as opposed to accrued dividends or some some other things you might see from time to time in this case keeping it simple dividends are all in cash so let's get started we're going to start with um oh, let me clear out this is an old vestige of an answer so we're going to clear this out we need to figure out what retained earnings are uh we need to figure out what cash uh, and current assets look like and um, and so we're going to have to build out the cash flow statement in order to get that answer. So let's start. We know that the first major add back in a cash flow statement is depreciation and amortization. I should back up and say that the first line in the cash flow statement using the most common method for cash flow statement presentation, which is the indirect method, really starts with net income, which we've already given you. We've referenced from here and starts making 
adjustments to that net income to arrive at not accounting profits, which is what net income represents, but it really says, what are the question, what are the adjustments I need to make to get from this 422 to get to how much cash actually went in my pocket as a result of operations during the period? In addition to that, there's the recognition that not all cash inflows and outflows are associated with operations. I could have certainly made some capital expenditures. I could have acquired businesses. I could have taken on loans. I could have issued stock. Those don't necessarily qualify as cash from operations. They qualify as cash from investing and financing activities. Those are also, though, inflows and outflows we have to take into account in order to figure out what is the net change in cash that's happened during the period. And that's how we're going to get to um, the cash flow. That's how we're going to complete the cash flow statement and figure out what is the end of year uh, cash balance. Okay, so um, the first major add back to get from accounting net income to cash in my pocket, which is cash from operations, um, how much cash did I generate uh, because of operations? The first major add back is depreciation and amortization. I'm going to hit the equal sign and then with the arrow keys, I'm going to go to depreciation and amortization. I'm going to hit enter. And that that's a non cash add back. So why are we doing that? Um, depreciation and amortization, although it's reducing my although it's an expense on the income statement, which reduces my net income, it is a non cash expense. In other words, nothing is actually happening from a cash standpoint because you've recognized depreciation and amortization. Your cash is still the same, uh, regardless of how much depreciation you uh, generate. So that's the first major add back. It's a non cash add back to net income to get to cash in my pocket. I'm going to go ahead and set up the placeholder for already for total cash from operations. And you'll notice that it started with net income. But once we made that add back, we actually have cash from operations going up, which is makes sense. There's actually more cash in my pocket than accounting profits so far. But now we turn our attention to cash inflows and outflows that occur because of changes in working capital. So let's look at our major working capital line items. We see accounts receivable on the balance sheet going up during the period, inventories going up, and we see the other major working capital item. It's a liability and that's accounts payable. I'm going to take a couple of them, talk about sort of the intuition behind, um, you know, how to treat changes on the balance sheet on the cash flow statement. And then we'll talk about the general rule that we can sort of develop from that. So accounts receivable. Let's think about what accounts receivable represent. We see that they appear to have gone up by around $8 million during the year, a little under $8 million. Let's also look at the income statement and recognize that within revenues, we have, we have $1.3 billion in revenues. Not all those revenues are cash revenues, or they don't have to be cash revenues. Um, Accrual-based accounting, which is the accounting method in which the income statement is presented, allows for revenues to be recognized even if you haven't gotten cash from it. As long as the services are earned um, and payment is reasonably assured, uh, we should be able to recognize those revenues even though maybe they've been they were credit sales and we haven't gotten the cash for them yet. So let's take a, a most simple example which we could explain the growth during uh, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year in accounts receivable. Well, certainly if there is a net increase in credit sales during the period, well, um, well, then I would see accounts receivable going up by that $8 million uh, increase. But what that would, by definition, imply is that net revenues don't, you know, are not all cash revenues. There is a net $8 million component in this line item um, that is not cash. And remember, our goal here is to get to cash revenues. And so what that means is I need to subtract that increase in accounts receivable. So I need to remove that increase of 7.6 million. Logic again being that those credit sales were captured within revenues and then ultimately in net income, overstating net income if you were to look at what is actually happening from a cash perspective. And from that we can actually extrapolate a rule, which is whenever working capital assets go up, in fact, the rule is whenever any assets go up, that represents a use of funds. And so the same logic can apply to inventories. We see inventories of going are going up. That is a use of funds. The logic being, how do you acquire the sort of the bigger picture logic is, hey, if inventories went up, I must have paid for them in cash somehow. Okay. Um, 
Let's look at accounts payable. Accounts payable is a little bit different. It's a liability. We see accounts payable going up from one period to the next. What does that represent? It means that we must have gotten something. And let's assume that SG&A, it's either SG&A or cost of goods sold. We must have gotten, we don't know exactly what it is that we've got with accounts payable. but we know that it tends to cycle through in selling general administrative expenses as well as cost of goods sold. It means that we must have gotten some of that on account instead of in cash. Well, what that means is that in this particular case, net income from an accounting standpoint is actually understating how much cash we generated because, hey, some of these expenses are non-cash expenses. In addition to depreciation and amortization, some of these COGS or SGA expenses are not in cash. How do we know? Well, because we see AP going up. So unlike assets, when we see working capital liabilities, and in fact, all liabilities going up, in fact, also all equity items, that represents a source of funds. And we're going to think about that again once we get to cash from financing activities, where it becomes really easy to sort of intuit why, you know, when debt goes up, why is that a source of, of funds? Or when, you know, we issue stock, why is that a source of funds? For working capital, it's a little tricky, but hopefully it'll give you a little bit of the intuition for why that's happening. Next, we get to deferred taxes. And here, um, deferred taxes are a little bit trickier than some of the other line items we've talked about now. And discussing really the, the, the nature of what generates deferred taxes is a little beyond the scope of this lesson. It's a topic of another lesson that we're going to have shortly. But for now, I'd like you to remember the rule. Assets going up represent an outflow of funds, and liabilities going up represent an inflow of funds. And there are two types of deferred taxes, in fact. There are both deferred tax assets, and here we recognize the cash impact of an increase of 22 million deferred tax assets should be reflected as an outflow. But we also have deferred tax liabilities. And an increase in deferred tax liabilities is actually an inflow. So with that, we've actually completed our, believe it or not, cash from operations. And it appears that while net income was 422 million, the amount of cash that actually goes into our pocket as a result of operations is only um, 418.8 million. Okay, in the next video, we're gonna complete this cash flow statement and take a step back and look at the entire three statements.